All right, I'm gonna be walking back here through the woods, very much overgrown trail. But uh, as I'm walking back, I need to go back and check on our spring back here in the woods. And um, I wanted to talk about why I teach that the King James Bible is perfect. Um, I am not ignorant of manuscript evidence. Let me say that at the very beginning. I understand about the Hebrew and I understand about the Greek. Uh, and those, that is a very um, elusive term, so to speak, to say the Hebrew and the Greek. Anytime you put the definitive, definitive article, the, in front of a singular word, Hebrew, or the Greek, you're implying that there's only one, which is not true. And uh, I studied manuscript evidence for years, read most of the books in print for and against the King James Bible. I understood about the thing of the received text, the Textus Receptus, and uh, versus the minority Alexandrian type text, Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus, all the, you know, different things like that. Majuscules, minuscules, cursives, unseals, all that stuff. And um, learned about the Hebrew, you know, the Stuttgart edition and, and the Masoretic Ben Shaim, uh, Masoretic Hebrew, and you know, there's different editions. And that's something that a lot of people don't understand. They'll say the Greek, not understanding that there are different families of manuscripts, so to speak, and that those families of manuscripts contradict one another. And you have different churches, like the Catholic Church, they have their manuscripts, the Greek Orthodox, they have their manuscripts, and then you have heretics that most of our Bibles have been burned down through the centuries. So it's kind of hard to say that what was the Bible that the original church had and whatever else. You can assume it's the Textus Receptus because there were so many copies of it made. And that would be correct in assuming that. Over 99% of all extant, in other words, ones that, have been, that are found, that have been collated, gone through, and whatever else, over 99% of extant Greek manuscripts line up with the King James Bible, or the uh, Textus Receptus. The King James Bible is the best translation of the Textus Receptus. Um, so what people do is they say, well, the Greek and the Hebrew are the ones that are perfect because it's what God originally inspired. But the problem is, you don't have any connection to the actual original autographs to prove what they actually said. All we have are copies of copies of copies. Hmm. So to take stands for the Greek and the Hebrew and say it is definitely the stand of Orthodox Christians. Well, or I should say Bible-believing Christians because I don't want to be confused with the Greek Orthodox system or the Russian Orthodox system that adds unscriptural traditions to the scriptures. A lot of the, the practices and everything else, I mean, just the fact that they have these huge cathedrals, there's nothing in the New Testament about that. And it doesn't matter what uh, corrupt Catholic or proper King James Bible reading type of things you have, there's no such thing as cathedrals being used by early Christians. It's just not there. So, uh, that's the first problem. Okay, this, oh, we can be sure of the Greek and the Hebrew. Eh, you know, I don't know about that. And then you get into the thing too of, well, we have the Texas Receptus versus the Nestle Lalonde. Um, well, that also is true, but there's also multiple editions of the Texas Receptus. Texas Receptus wasn't even coined in Erasmus's day. Desiderius Erasmus made what was later, he compiled the first set of uh, Greek manuscripts um, that later became known as the Texas Receptus. But if you would have said to Erasmus, you know, hey, are you working on the Texas Receptus? He would have said, the what? You know, uh, that wasn't called that till many years later with the Elzever brothers. But you had um, Stephanus and Biza and a bunch of others that came out with their own editions of the text that Erasmus had originally compiled. And again, remember, these guys are compiling manuscripts. They are not writing manuscripts. They're just simply coming together and saying, okay, I have this manuscript and that manuscript. And the, one of the big lies that's told about Erasmus, well, partial lie, it's a partial truth. They'll say Erasmus only had a few late manuscripts. Well, obviously, if you're going to compile uh, a text, you don't look for the very oldest ones that you can find that are fragile and brittle and whatever. 
you get the newer ones that say the same thing as the ancient ones. That should be obvious. And you don't need of the over 5,000 extant Greek manuscripts which line, underlie the Textus Receptus. You don't need all 5,000 of them laying out there on the table to compile a text that basically says this is what's in the Textus Receptus. All right, so just to explain that, um, what they do in the average Bible college, they come in and they say, we're going to teach you how to read the Greek so that you can clarify and you can correct the area where the areas where the uh, translators of whatever Bible version you use could have been a little bit more, more clear. And that, uh, you know, this, this whole thing of um, we want to make the Bible speak in its original languages. Oh, uh, you know why that's done? I'm just going to cut right through all the stupid nonsense and everything else of why they come out with that and they'll, they'll try to deceive you on it, but I'm just going to speak very frankly because I don't have some kind of a alma mater that I've gone to and then I have to hold up the standards of my birth mother there, my alma mater, Latin for birth mother or virgin mother, you could say kind of either one, but you see I don't have some kind of a thing that I have to look good, I don't. I don't have any pride in that issue that I have a PhD that I need to defend. And how dare you speak against the Reverend Dr. Brian Denlinger or something. <laughs> uh, nonsense. Um, the reason that they teach their students Greek and Hebrew is because they have to set up the old Roman Catholic priest or clergy and laity system again. Where you have, you go to church and you have the holy man of God up there that um, he knows the ancient languages and he can tell you what was in the original and um, you're just too stupid you don't you have to do your mouth you know you have to make it really official and you know you're just too stupid to be able to understand the original languages and um, had you actually gone to Harvard Divinity School or, or some other lower school uh, you would be able to understand things on my level but you are just laity after all and I might actually give you some duties there, Christian layman, that you can carry out in the church. <laughs> um, that does not lead to a strong group of Christians. It leads to weakness. It leads to that dark age system that the Catholic Church used to control people for centuries. Keep people down. Keep people ignorant. And the Catholic Church used the... Uh, basically the whole thing of you couldn't read Latin. So they, it wasn't just that you can't understand the scriptures and you need a pastor to tell you what it means, but it also goes into the thing of now you can't even understand the language of the scriptures. You see how it works? So I come to you to preach the word of God and I have to preach out of a different language translation or as a, from the original languages and you don't understand what I'm saying. And so I have to interpret you, interpret the scriptures for you. You can't find anything. It, it's not you and the Lord and you, his word. No, no, it's you and brother, pastor, reverend, holy, you know, doctor, Brian Denlinger, and you, and then the Lord, you know. See, that's why I reject that whole system. You know, William Tyndale uh, was a Catholic priest before he got saved. And um, he was sitting at the table the one time, and this, um, I, don't, I don't remember if it was a Catholic bishop or a cardinal, but uh, he was sitting there and, and complaining about the laity and whatever else, and it made Tyndale mad, and he said, you know, if God spare my life ere many years, I will see that the boy that driveth the plow knoweth more of the scriptures than thou dost. I think this is the, close to the exact quote, but he's basically saying, my desire is, and if God spares my life, I'm going to see that the boy that drives the plow knows more of the scripture than you do. You see, that's how you take down the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. It is impossible to mentally or socially enslave a Bible-reading people, not a people that submit to their pastor because he knows Greek and Hebrew. That's nonsense. And Eric Phelps has come out and he said that I'm a heretic because I teach King James Bible perfection. You know why? Because Phelps has a desire to lord over the people. That's why. He wants to be a big shot and have, oh, I know all these things and I can, I'm a scholar and I can do all this other stuff. Uh, hey, Phelps, you want to 
make problems for the Jesuits, then put the power into the hands of God's people, not behind the pulpits. Chain the Bible to the pulpits like they did back in the Catholic churches. Let's chain it there so the people, the common man, can't mess up the Bible. And uh, I remember sitting in a Baptist church, Cornerstone Baptist Church, many years ago, and Chuck Taft was the guy's name. What a stupid heretic that guy was. Stupid, idiot, heretic, wicked. I think a guy might have even been a Jesuit. I have no idea. Teacher at a Mennonite school. And he was teaching Sunday school the one time. And he, I remember he said, he said that uh, that's dangerous. That he actually told me one time I was what I was speaking about, the King James Bible was dangerous. Um, but he, he said it's dangerous for laity to get their hands on the Bible. And uh, he said all heresies come from laymen that don't know how to properly exegete the scriptures. And I thought, well, that's not true. That's not true at all. If you look at all the different heresies, heresies, I get taken out by the, must be a Catholic tree here. There, I killed it. Death to the Catholics, or whatever. <laughs> Little joke there. Um, but I'll show that here in a minute. There's the spring right here at my feet. But, um, the actual heresies come from the educated people. German rationalism and, and uh, naturalistic textual criticism and things like that. It comes from the, the clergy, the people that are into getting uh, PhDs, doctor of uh, philosophy. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Huh. Yeah. Um, we'll get back to this in just a minute here, but I've, I've arrived at my destination. Um, down here, you can see this big rock right here beside it. There's some water laying in there. You can't see the spring right now, but there's a spring right there. It's a, what would be called a side hill seep. This is a little bit of a hill here. There's one here and there's one over that way. And, um, someday when I can get the time, I want to put a pipe in that will run from that spring back there, right beside that rock, and go down down the hill to our trail down here, which I'm going to walk down to now. Um, but the water is definitely moving here, and I have to be careful where I stand because I don't want to go into the into the water. I don't have rubber boots on or anything today. Okay. Um, it's a very wet area back in here. Try to walk through this. But the spring, it flows, you know, throughout the winter and then it flows into the spring. It's a spring in the spring, you know. But um, you can see down here the wet areas and the water is running over there, especially like that. So, but getting back to my subject at hand here. Um, this whole thing that you have to have the Greek and the Hebrew or else it's going to lead to cult-like behavior. You know, it's interesting because that's what Roman Catholicism teaches. I wonder why Eric Phelps would be saying something that a Roman Catholic says. That's kind of an interesting thing. Let's keep the Bible out of the hands of the common man because it could lead to cult-like behavior. Hmm. That's kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, you come to this ministry you will learn one thing, and that is you will learn that I believe that the King James Bible is God's perfect word. And I'm going to arm you and help you sharpen your sword so that you can go out and you can provide an answer to every man out there. Or you can say, hey, um, you can answer a Catholic, you can answer a Buddhist, you can answer a Muslim, uh, whatever, New Age or whatever else. You can see, I'll show you here. Let me turn around. You can see down there where the water's flowing. So, and that is uh, pure spring water coming right out up there. So, what you want to do is you want to pipe that. And if I can get a pipe that can go downhill here. By the time it gets down to the bottom of that hill, it'd be probably shooting out of the pipe. 
that's a very strong spring this year it didn't even dry up most years it does but because we had so much rain this year it never dried up so um, hiking down through here these are beech trees here these leaves the leaves will stay on the tree they turn to that kind of a rust collar brown like that and then they just stay on the trees all winter um, that's how they do that and seeing a lot of swampy stuff here but uh, there's a lot of springs in in Maine our other property that we had years ago um, had a nice spring on it you can probably hear the spring water now running from stop making my noises there And you can see the spring water. Can't think of that hymn. Springs of living water. Da, 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 da. Happy now am I. My soul they satisfy. I went my foot into the mud. Um, can't think of how that. A wonderful and bountiful supply. I don't remember how the song goes, but if you know the song, put it in the comment section below. See if I can get over here without completely getting muddy. Ugh, okay, there, I made it through. But let me continue on my little woods walk rant here. Um, brethren, it just, it really angers me. Because so much of, of, of Bible-believing Christianity, it's just so logical. It's so rational. If you're going to call a book God's Word... Wouldn't it logically follow that that book would have to be perfect? You know? Oh, that's such a heretical belief. Why? I mean, if you have just a translation, it's just a, it's not the same as the original, or, then don't call it God's Word. And, you know, again, how's that going to make any kind of faith? The just shall live by faith. Uh, no, not really, because we have to just constantly be wondering if we have the true Word of God or not. We're not really sure. It's a, it's a good translation um, where it's... Or, you know, I've actually heard some of these dumb heretics, they'll say, um, that the King James Bible... Here's our trail that I'm on right now. The King James Bible is a perfect translation... Or is a perfect Bible where it's accurately translated. Uh-oh. Uh, that's a problem. So it's perfectly accurately translated here, but not over here. So then you just ignore the other parts over here. And Okay, where's your authority then? And again, it goes back to that. What is your authority if no perfect Bible exists on this earth? You are the authority. You are the one that has to come out and say, I will define what the Word of God is. That's a problem. That's a big problem. Um, trying to see here I covered all my things on my little notes here one other thing is um, I do have the thing of faith not doubt which I've just been talking about there but uh, I determined early on when I was studying um, I was studying because I, w I was not studying for the ministry okay again you know there was I think it's another big problem that we have with a lot of the young men that go off to seminary. They're studying to be in ministry, and it's ministry or bust. You know, it doesn't matter to me. I know I'm called. I'm going to be a, the best preacher out there. I'm going to make a good living and whatever else. Um, you know, are you chosen of God? Well, I don't know, but I'm going to be, I'll choose myself for service. Well, that doesn't work. Um, there's a lot of heretics out there that have a lot of Bible college education and they come out as completely lost, just total heretics. But then you get other guys that, like myself that just said, I have questions. That's the only thing I had. I just want to know. Um, I want to understand what is this book called the Bible? Where did it come from? How did it get from back in the first century to me today? Do I have the right Bible? You know. Uh, my whole uh, um, study 
thing on the Bible version issue started because of somebody, my older brother let me borrow some Kent Hovind videos and I was watching and Kent Hovind said about these missing verses in the NIV. And Kent Hovind has scores of problems. I think he's a fraud, but the whole point is, you know, what about these uh, missing verses? And I paused the video and I ran upstairs and I got my NIV beside my bed, dusted it off, <laughs> because it was not one that I actually read. I only read the Bible back then, or my NIV. I only read it, you know, because of going to church buildings and they would, you want to go on a mission trip, you have to memorize a couple verses or something like this. And so I would read my NIV, memorize the verses, and quickly say them when I go to the place. Okay, you passed. All right, okay. Can I go on a mission trip now? Yeah, sure. You know, you're a, a fine Christian because you can memorize verses out of your new version. Yeah, buddy. And, uh, put my mud again there. And that was the only reason I had an NIV and used an NIV, but... I went and I got it and I looked up Acts 8, 37, Mark 9, 44, Mark 9, 46, you know, the different verses that the NIV takes out because they're not in their uh, Catholic manuscripts, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, or Sinaiticus, or whatever, however you want to say it. People get all excited about that too. That's a whole other issue. But um, I went and I searched it and I looked it up and yeah, they're not in there. Not in the two oldest and best manuscripts. And I thought, that doesn't make any sense. If there are older and better manuscripts than what the King James Bible translators had, then that doesn't make sense to me. Wouldn't they have had access to those older and better manuscripts? And uh, if you study it out, Erasmus did talk about the uh, Vaticanus manuscript. But yes, he did in fact have access to it. Um... Sinaiticus, I don't think he had access to Sinaiticus because I think Sinaiticus was created in the 19th century. Constantine von Tischendorf with the Greek guy Simonides or whatever his name is. Um, you know, so I don't think that Erasmus had access to that because the Sinaiticus because it wasn't created yet. Uh, that's a whole other issue. But, you know, looked into it and I thought wow this is weird that they took this these things out of there these verses out of there and I, I thought I need to know more about this and I started to research and study everything I could get my hands on and I just basically quit any desire to be a professional wood turner I would still do it occasionally you know to, to make money but I'd spend my money on books and videos and audios and whatever else and um i studied i read i researched i had no desire if you just said to me back then this would have been probably uh the year 2000 um if you just said to me back then that uh are you so you're studying for the ministry i just said what <laughs> ministry are you kidding me of all people no i'm not going into ministry i just want answers to my questions and that's the right way to start. Not with this thing of, that's going to be a problem this winter with snowmobiling. I have to take care of that thing. But that's the right way to start. You start out saying, I just want answers to my questions. And it's up to the Lord to put me into ministry or to do whatever he wants with me. But some of these little pansies out there, they come out of their little Baptist churches. And I went to a Baptist school and private school where I was homeschooled or something. And, and uh, praise the Lord for homeschooling. I'm not cutting on that. But what I'm saying is they never experience anything in the world. They have no experience. Well, they come out and, oh, I know I'm called. God's called me to be in ministry. I know it. I know it for sure. Uh-huh. Yeah, I know. He definitely has. No question about it. And then they go off to their college or their seminary and whatever. And they're taught what to believe. And, they're, and again, you're not given the option of disagreeing with the professor. At this school, we teach the, you know, Nestle's text is the best and whatever else. You're not given an option to disagree. So you come out and you say, well, I had to, in order to pass, I had to go along with this stuff. And, and, um, and you come out and you just repeat what you've been taught. And you might, some of these guys, you know, they'll come out and they'll say, well, I wasn't taught right here and I wasn't taught right there. But I never met one that said, 
what a satanic waste of time. I should have never gone to that place. It was just of the devil and whatever. Uh, they, there's some kind of a little special thing there that they just kind of say, I can't cut on my alma mater. You know, she did so much for me. Oh, brother so-and-so, professor so-and-so, he was such a wonderful, you know, guide to me, spiritually speaking, and oh, I'm just so thankful for brother so-and-so. It was lying to you, trying to mess you up. But I know, but you know, uh... And they come out, and that's why these guys have to feel like this thing of, I have to hold this Greek and Hebrew thing above people. And I have to be able to, to expound the scriptures to them in ways that they can't possibly understand. Such a shame. So, um, at the end of the day, brethren, here's how it works. Either you have the Word of God or you don't. Either you can speak with confidence about your King James Bible, or you have to just speak with doubt. You have to be a hypocrite. You say, this book is God's Word. God's Word is to be our authority. God's Word is to be our, our guide in life. And you lie to people. You make people think that it's your King James Bible. But then when you get cornered, you say, well, no, it's actually not perfect. Actually, it needs to be updated. And you know, there's a few places where, you know, baptism should have been translated differently. And, and this should have been translated, you know, Pascha should have been Passover, not Easter. That was another little boo-boo that the translators made. And I know all about all the little errors in the King James Bible. And Holy Spirit shouldn't have been called it or that holy thing. Or, you know, the, all this different stuff. It's, it's speaking of in a neuter. And, and in the Greek, it's a... You know, and back when I was studying, I remember I got to the point where I thought, I'm reading all these books and, you know, knowledge puffeth up and everything. And I'm thinking, okay, here I am. I'm understanding all this stuff. But at what point in time am I going to be given my, my orders to go out and engage the enemy? Um, where's my weapon at? I want a weapon that I can go out and I can attack the enemy. Um, and I look back at all the years that the King James Bible was used and that believers said, went out with confidence and said, you know what, this is God's book. And I thought, you know, if they could do it and be successful working for the Lord, why can't I do it today? Huh. You know, if the King James translators were, su were such dummies back then, and we're so much smarter now and we have newer, more advanced uh, Greek things and whatever, um, then that would be evolution. That's evolution philosophy. That's not Bible-believing Christianity. I thought, hmm, I wonder what would happen if I just preached the Bible, the King James Bible, 1769 edition that I have, my Cambridge King James Bible. What would happen if I actually tried to live by that book? and just rejected the teachings and the doctrines of men and went with my King James Bible and didn't worry about trying to study Greek and Hebrew so I could look like I'm smarter than other people. I wonder what would happen if I did that. And guess what? That's what I have done. In another swamp area here again, much like modern Christianity, it's a swamp. <laughs> so brethren, if you want some guy that's a scholar and very highly educated and, and well respected of in academia circles, then you're at the wrong place. Um, my name is Brian Denlinger. You can call me Brother Brian Denlinger. You can call me whatever you want, but don't call me pastor. Don't call me bishop. Don't call me reverend, especially. Please don't ever do that. And you'll never have to worry about me going out and getting a PhD or an honorary doctorate or whatever else, I don't want one. I am a common man. Um, the Lord will use me until he sees fit to go on and do something else. Um, and then I'm done. It's just that simple. So, um, I would caution very heavily against listening to Eric Phelps. Uh, see my battery's running out here. The time is running out as well. Let me switch. I'll come back and I want to say a few more things. Be right back. All right, I'm back oh, in a swampy area here again. Trying to walk without going into the water in the swamp mud. But uh, 
Normally this is a pretty dry trail, but all the rain we had. Uh, I like doing the walk and talks. It gives people a chance to see some um, of God's creation, nice scenery and things, beautiful fall foliage. And uh, that's why I do it. But I have to caution people about Eric John Phelps. Anytime you get a guy that calls himself a Christian and he can't figure out the basics of uh, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes, the man regularly ad advises people you have to watch such and such movie. Please watch this movie. You'll be, they lay out their plans and whatever else. Um, that's a violation of scripture. You're not supposed to do that. Why would you watch the filthy garbage of Hollywood? It makes no sense to me. Uh, I hate Hollywood. Hollywood robbed me of my purity. It was Hollywood that uh, started to put perverted images into my mind. Hollywood that, that ultimately pushed me towards pornography. And all the other wicked, horrible things that messed me up for many years. I got saved. My desire for movies went poof. Gone. Um, I won't say I'm, I'm not so perfect and holy and without sin that I, I can say I was never even tempted after that. No, I was tempted. But you know what always goes back to um, if I even watch a little bit of a couple minutes of one or something. Oh, that's right. I remember that movie. And the Lord will start to chasten me and say, stop that. Shut that off. That's not for a Christian to watch. And for me to recommend movies? Oh God, have mercy on my soul if I ever do. Um, I don't recommend Hollywood movies. It's wickedness. So, um, I know a lot of my viewers also like to listen to Eric Phelps because he puts out stuff against the Jesuits. Fine and dandy, that's wonderful. I don't care who it is that puts out information against the Jesuits. That's good. But uh, in terms of trusting a guy like that, not on your life. And you go after the perfection of the King James Bible, you are a wicked, wicked heretic. Don't you call me a heretic, Phelps. You're the one who's a heretic trying to destroy. Oh, let's, let's raise up an army. Let's raise up a standard against the Jesuit order. And how are we doing it? By putting people's faith, not in the Bible that they hold in their hands. No. Let's put people's faith in a language that they don't even understand. It's not even relevant to Christians today. Let's get them back to two dead languages. Hebrew, I realize there are some people that speak Hebrew, but uh, Hebrew, but Koine Greek. Please. But we have to have that old priest and laity, the old clergy and laity class, don't we, Phelps? So go ahead, put out your information, diminish people's faith, in the written word of God, as I try to build up Christians, try to get Christians to have faith in what they read. Greatest Bible ever that showed up on this earth. And you want to tear that down? Then God have mercy on you. So, that will be it for that study. Um, you know, I mean, I oh brother, you should have done it in a in a uh, studio setting and less distractions. What, why? Uh, people aren't going to listen. You have your mind made up. You don't want the authority of Scripture in your life. You want to be the God that can interpret what is holy and what is not. Then uh, all my pleadings and all my speeches and everything else won't mean a thing to you. Um, you want to go through life with that kind of a testimony testimony of a hypocrite you preach to the lost that the king james bible is god's word and yet privately you say well it's not perfect go ahead see where where that gets you um as for me i will stand by the king james bible i'll live by it i'll die by it i put it to the test Many times, thousands and thousands of times, I put that book to the test. I said, okay, Lord, your word says this. 
I'm going to live by that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to follow it as it is written without a need to feel like I have to change it or clarify. I mean, if you have to clarify something, you know, this water that's all around me here, the swampy water, it's dirty, it's muddy. If I clarify it, does that mean that the water's on the same level? The clear water, the muddy water? No. Muddied waters need to be clarified. The King James Bible is not muddy waters. The King James Bible is not murky. It won't deceive you. Well, I read it and I didn't quite understand what baptism means because of the word should be translated baptisto or something. Wicked, wicked people. So, uh, that will be it. I do hope that you out there um, don't waste your time with any man that doesn't believe in the book that he holds in his hands. Simple standard. Please take heed to my words. Stand by your King James Bible. It won't let you down.